as I mentioned to you, something the Lord has been sharing uh, with my heart the last several days. Um, each of you received a glass stone, and I'd like for you to kind of keep it with you this morning um, throughout the service. I want to share with you for a few minutes this morning on what do you have in your hand. In light of the fact that we are coming to the close of a year and we are embarking on the precipice of a brand new season, with all the things that God is about to do in our lives, and I have, I have to tell you, I have more anticipation uh, more excitement about what God is going to do in our lives, but as well what God is going to do in our church. God has been doing some incredible things uh, here in our church, and I'm excited about what this upcoming year uh, is going to be for us as a church. But in light of those things, I want to reiterate, reiterate the question to you this morning. What do you have in your hand? What do you have that God has given you to use for the purpose of his kingdom. What do you have in your hand that God has given to enable you? I have often shared with you that we serve a God who is a God of purpose. There are no accidents. There are no mistakes in the kingdom of God. Man may make mistakes, but how many know God makes no mistakes? God makes absolutely no mistakes. Everything God does is because God has a purpose and God has a plan. Each of us that are gathered together in this place today, we have been given gifts, we've been given talents, we've been given abilities that are to be used for the purpose of the kingdom of God. 2015 is nearly past. 2016 is on our doorstep. So I want to ask you again today, what do you have in your hand? Jesus Christ is soon to return and to gather his church from the four corners of this earth. And when he does so, there will be literally multiplied millions of people who will be left behind. In light of that, I ask you, what do you have in your hand? The majority of our community, Grant County, the majority of Grant County does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. In light of that, I ask you today, what do you have in your hand? We have a group of boys and girls and young people within the walls of this congregation that need to be discipled and need to be mentored and need to be taught in the things of God. In light of that, I ask you today, what do you have in your hand? This morning, I want to take a few minutes and talk about what you have in your hand. You know, usually when, when we look in our hand, we look at what's been placed there. Most times we are confronted with the thought that what I have in my hand is usually not enough. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. I'm going to share with you some different passages for a few moments this morning. 1 Samuel 17 and 40. What we find here is the Israelites are facing their most formidable enemy. It is Goliath of Gath. We find that Goliath came out, they were lined up for battle, one on one side of the cliff, one on the other side. And when they would, Goliath would come out and shout his defiance of the people of Israel and the God of Israel. The Bible tells us that when he would come and he would begin to shout his defiance, that the Israelite army, these men who were skilled warriors, he was such a fierce enemy, they would run in fear. Day after day, he came out and shouted his defiance. And yet they didn't take any stand. What we find is that God gets a hold of a young boy by the name of David. 
when the king and all the king's men were filled with fear, there was young, one young boy by the name of David whose heart was filled with faith. Faith that could see the God of the impossible. Faith that could believe that his God could do anything. And what we find is David goes to the king and he says, Hey, king, I know everybody's hiding in fear, but don't let your servants, don't let these people lose heart because I will go and fight the giant. And the king, of course, said, Son, he's a skilled warrior. You have no chance to fight him. And he says, I've been in the field. God, God gave me victory over the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And God will give me victory over this uncircumcised Philistine. He will be no different. And what we find is Saul agrees to it. And then Saul tries to put all of his armor on David. And David says, I can't. I can't wear this. This is not my size. This is too big for me. This, there's a big lesson here in this, but we don't have time to go there. The armor was for the king to lead in. But the king would not lead with the armor, so he tried to give the armor to somebody else. Husbands, God has some armor for you to lead your families in. It's not your wife. Your wife can't bear it. Only you can bear it. Only you can lead. It's getting quiet in the church house now. The king was trying to give his armor to somebody else, but it wouldn't work. David said, I can't do this. David hands it, heads out to the battlefield. That's where we pick up in verse number 40, 1 Samuel 17 and verse number 40. It says, then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, verses 4 through 7 in that 17th chapter describe the enemy that David and Israel uh, was up against. And I want, to, I want to read that for you. And if you have your Bible, you can look there with me. Uh, because it describes well what they're up against. Verse 4 begins, And a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Some of your Bibles in the notation will tell you he was over nine feet tall. How many know that's a big boy? I'm right at six foot, so if you want to take half of my height and add it again to my height. Look there with me. He had a bronze helmet on his head. And he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze. Look at this, weighing 5,000 shekels. 5,000 shekels was about 125 pounds. I don't know about y'all, but I just get wore out carrying bags of softener salt that weigh 40 pounds. <laughs> a coat of armor weighing 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung over his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. The iron point weighed about 15 pounds. <laughs> I can see a lot of us, we'd be holding it and it'd be falling down. <laughs> and his shield bearer went ahead of him. I think it'd be an understatement to say that Goliath was a formidable foe. When you look at David and you ask the question that I'm asking you today. If you were to ask David, what do you have in your hand? David would have simply held out his hand and he would have had a slingshot. Imagine with me now, here's this formidable foe over nine feet tall. Bronze coat of scale armor, 125 pounds. The tip of the end of his spear, about 15 pounds. This is a trained, skilled warrior. What did David have in his hand? A sling. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I was going after that enemy, I think I might want to have a little bit more of that. I don't know about you, but probably if I had to face Goliath and I said, hey, somebody give me a weapon, and somebody brought me a sling, 
I don't know about you, but my heart would probably sink. I'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. You give me a sling. This man is covered in armor. Listen, friends. It may have been hardly enough to take down his enemy. But in a few moments, we're going to look at the fact that the sling was there in the purpose of God. And what you hold in your hand today, that piece, that glass stone, is just a simple visual reminder that God too has put something in your hand. And often when we are faced with the things that lie ahead of us, the tasks that God has given to us, we often look in our hand and we say, it surely isn't enough to accomplish the task. In your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, let me give you the story here. Here's what we find. We find that Elijah the prophet has declared there will be no rain in the land for a span of time. Because there's no rain in the land, the crops aren't growing, there's no water that's that's available for the majority of a lot of the people. There's no food. Famine begins to fill the land. Of very, very difficult times. And so we find that God takes Elijah and he puts him by a stream of water. That stream of water then dries up. And God says, okay, it's time to move. He says, I'm taking you to this town And when you get there, there's going to be a lady. I want you to talk to her. And he comes into the town, and here is a widow woman. And she has some sticks that she's collecting. And as he comes to the area, he says to her, every time they would come into a city gate, there would be a well. And uh, he came in, and he asked, like, could you give me uh, a drink of water? And so she gets him the water, and now he says to her, Uh, will you give me something to eat? And she says, oh, sir, you don't understand. She said, "Uh, I've got a a little bit of meal and uh, I'm collecting these sticks. I've got a little meal, a little oil, and what I'm doing, I'm collecting these sticks. I'm going to go home, I'll make a fire. Over the fire, I'm going to make a little cake. And because the famine is so severe, my son and I are going to eat that cake and we don't have anything else. And so this literally is going to be our last meal. We're going to eat it. And then we're going to die. That's, that's where we pick up 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 12. Here is uh, the response of that lady. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Notice only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. God is a God of purpose. God always has a plan. Throughout the drought, throughout the famine in the land, God would provide Elijah and the widow woman and her son through a simple handful of flour and a little bit of olive oil. Now the truth is in the natural, there was simply not enough there to meet the need. But here's what we find. Elijah says to her, here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to first go home and make me something to eat. I want you to take what seems to be nothing and insignificant in your hand, only a handful of flour. I want you to go home and make a cake. And he says, then I want you to give it to me. And when you've given that cake to me, then I want you to make some for yourself and your son. And I want you to eat. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd been that woman, I would have said, I know you're a prophet, but evidently you're off your game today. I just told you I only have enough for myself and my son. She didn't say that. She obeyed the words of the prophet and the man of God. We find she goes home, she makes the cake for the prophet, gives him the food, she turns around. And what was just a simple handful of flour and a little bit of oil in the jug, she turned around, and there's the same amount. 
She makes the food for herself and her son. They eat. We find throughout the word of the Lord because the prophet, the man of God had spoken the word and she obeyed. What was a simple little bit in her hand provided for Elijah and for the widow and her son throughout the entire drought. But friends, all she had was a little handful of flour, a little bit of meal in her hand. So I want to ask you today, what do you have in your hand? It may seem insignificant. It may seem like not enough. I want to take you to one more, one more scripture, Luke chapter 9, verse 13. Here's what we find. This is the feeding of the 5,000. Most of you all know this story. Jesus has been teaching all day long. The people have been there listening. The Bible records there was 5,000 men plus women and children. So easily, easily this could have been a crowd of fifteen to 20,000 people. So it's getting the end of the day. And the disciples said, hey, these people are getting tired. They're getting weary. You should send them away. And let them get something to eat. Jesus, I love, I love Jesus' response. Jesus just turned around and said, you give them something to eat. Be careful what you tell Jesus to do. Because he may just turn the tables on you. He said, you give them something. And they said, oh, Jesus, it would take eight months of a man's wages to buy enough bread to feed this group of people. We don't have that. Jesus said, what do you have? Listen, friends, Jesus is not concerned about what you don't have. Jesus is looking for what you do have. He's looking for what's in your hand now. What, not what you want to be in your hand later, but what you have in your hand now. He said, what do you have? And they said, well, let's look around. And so they find a small boy. Leave it to the disciples. They'll steal a small boy's lunch. For Jesus' purpose. They said, Jesus, here we are. All we have is five little loaves and two fish. That's hardly enough to feed this crowd. That's enough for the boy. But it's not enough for even Jesus and the disciples, let alone the 5,000 men plus women and children. Friends, when you look into your hands and you only see five loaves and two fish, when you look in your hand, do you only see a handful of flour and a little oil? When you're faced with a big task ahead of you, do you only see in your hand a shepherd's sling? I want to ask you again today, what? Do you have in your hand? Not only do we understand that usually when we look in our hand, it doesn't seem like it's enough. But secondly, I would share with you today, remember that what's in your hand came from him. What's in your hand came from him. The sling and the stones in David's hands were from God. God created everything that is. The flower and the oil were God's provision for the widow before the drought ever came. The five loaves, the two fish, were from him. They were each God's creation and his design. God is the giver of all things. And often we are tempted to compare what we are given with what another person has. Truthfully, it doesn't matter what your neighbor has in their hand. Honestly, I have to ask questions. What does that have to do with what's in your hand? Now, some of you today, I chose uh, the stone for you. And, and I did that on purpose. Because the stone that you have has been given to you by purpose of design. I specifically chose the stone you would receive. And now some of you, you have a stone about this size. Some of you, uh, some of you have a little one. 
And some of you, uh, like this one, man, this one is beautiful. It's a kind of a green iridescent. It's just beautiful color. And, and some of y'all got the plain boring white clear. And you know, isn't it easy? In fact, I'd venture to guess, I'd venture to guess this morning that probably some of you looked in your hand and then saw what your neighbor had and said, well, I wish you to give me that. You looked at your neighbor and said, hey, can we trade? (laughs) You know, when you consider what's in your hand, when you consider what you've been given, often the first thing that we are tempted to do is to compare what we have with what somebody else has. Listen, I didn't give Paul a specific one and Thomas specific one, I, guys, let me see what I gave you. Can I see yours? Okay. Now see, Tom just got a simple little square one. Paul got the fancy one, the iridescent one. You know what? I didn't give this bigger one to Paul because I loved Paul more. I just gave it to him because that's the one I wanted him to have. Now, some of you got the little round ones, and you might look at Tom's and go, well, mine's boring. Tom got, you know, a nice little square one, and it's got a little color to it, and it's kind of faceted a little bit, and, you know, my, I just got the simple little round white one. I didn't give Tom his and what you received because I loved him more than I loved you. It simply was just in my process that I chose, I want you to have this one, and I want you to have that one. See, it has nothing to do with what he's been given or he's been given. And often, friends, when we start talking about things in the kingdom of God, we begin comparing what somebody else has with what we have, and we begin saying, you know what, what I have really isn't that important. You know, I I can't sing the way he can sing or she can sing. I can't teach a class. I can't speak the way they can speak. I can't do the things they can do. And so mine really isn't much. Listen, friends, I want to remind you that what you have in your hand is what he chose to give you. What's been placed in your care is there because that's the one that God wanted you to have. What's in your hand was given by God. It was not given as a means. God never intended for your gifting to be compared to somebody else's gifting. God gave you a gift and he says, now I want you to be a faithful steward of what I've given you. God has a purpose in what's in your hand. God has a plan for what he wants you to accomplish. God has a purpose for what he's placed in your life. Often we're tempted to say, well, you know, if I, if I had one of those pretty pieces, I could really do something special with that. You might say, you know, if... If I had something that really looked good, I could do something great for God. If, if my gifting was like theirs, then God could really use me to do something incredible. You might say, I'll never have a chance to be anything for God because I just don't have anything. And, and you look at what's in your hand and you grieve what he's placed in your hand. Never forget, God is the author of your life. God is the author of your destiny. And he can use whatever he's placed in your hands. And friends, listen to me. May God give us revelation on this. It's not about the greatness of our giftings. It's about the faithfulness of our giftings. God did not call you and I to be great. He called us to be faithful. To some he will give many, to some he will give you. But we're all, listen, we're all servants in the kingdom. And our goal 
is not to outdo one another. Our goal is not that every one of us, listen, you know, today it wouldn't have been real special if everybody would have gotten the exact same piece. Oh, my piece is as good as your piece. Actually, I think mine's a little shinier than yours, but isn't that how we work? (laughs) It would have been pretty boring. Listen, God chose to give each one of us different gifts for the betterment of the body and the kingdom of God. Don't look with disregard. Don't look with bitterness at what's been placed in your hands. Listen, if you got one of the little clear circle ones, whatever he's placed in your hands, give it everything you've got to use that to its fullest potential for his glory. I ask you again today, what is in your hands? Third, and last of all this morning, I want to encourage you today to give thanks for what you've been given. Give thanks for what you've been given. We find in 1 Samuel that David used his sling for the glory of God. We find in 1 Kings 17, the widow of Zarephath used the handful of meal and a little bit of oil for the glory of God to sustain the man of God, the prophet of God. We find in the feeding of the 5,000 that it was just the five loaves and the two fish given into Jesus' hands. They gave to Jesus what they had. Listen, these things didn't transpire in a miracle until they were given. The widow, had she not obeyed the word of the Lord, most likely would have ate that last meal and her and her son would have died. Holding and grasping on to the handful of flour and a little bit of oil. The people that day would have went away hungry had the disciples refused to give Jesus what they had. But I want you to see something this morning. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. It is the story here of the feeding of the 5,000. Luke 9 verses 16 and 17. We find Jesus doing something. I think it's a critical key for you and I. Verse 16 says, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people Listen to this. They all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Jesus took what seemed to be insignificant. Jesus took what seemed to be worthless. And he held them up to heaven. And he gave thanks He took the five loaves and the two fish, not nearly enough to complete the task, but he took simply what he had and held it up to heaven and said, My Father, I give you thanks for these things you have given to us. Friends, as you and I stand on the precipice of yet another year, I would challenge you to not disdain or look down on what God has placed in your hands, but rather hold up before God what he's placed in your hands and give thanks Give thanks for what he's given you. Give thanks for the gifting. Give thanks for the talent. Give thanks for the grace that he's given to you. Don't look at it with disfavor. Don't look at it as never enough. Don't look at it as mine's not as good as somebody else's. Instead of despising the small beginnings, begin to celebrate and give thanks for them. Give thanks for what you have. Not everyone, listen, not everyone is suited for the same giftings. That's the truth. Often we look with envy at somebody else and we say, wow, you know, if God would use me too if I had what they have. Or we look with envy and we say, wow, I sure wish I could have what they have. When in reality, friend, you don't know the burden they bear in carrying that thing. 
We're always wanting something bigger. Maybe, maybe we ought to just celebrate the small piece he gave us. You may not understand the burden that comes with the big piece because the Bible says to whom much is given, what? Much will be required. Don't look with distaste on what God's placed in your hands. Don't look with disdain with what God has given you. Give thanks for what he's placed in your hand. Give thanks to him. Rejoice. Rejoice. You say, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. Rejoice for what you can do. Now, it's quiet today in the church house. Give thanks for what you can do. Well, I can't this and I can't that. What can you do? Well, I can do this. People say, well, I'll never be able to sing like Tom Kellum can sing. I won't either. You know why? Because I'm not Tom Kellum. He's Tom Kellum. They made one and broke the mold. (laughs) You see, that's the gifting that God has given him. I have always, I've known Tom for longer than Tom and I probably want to admit And I've often enjoyed hearing Tom sing. I always, when I hear Tom sing, I always like to just kind of close my eyes because when Tom sings, he has such a smooth, uh, soothing voice. And I I just like to hear him sing. When I sing, it don't come out that way. It's not smooth. It's not soothing. And the reason why is because that's his gifting and not mine. When you look at what's in your hand, don't compare it with what somebody else has. Don't say, well, man, mine will never be anything because I I just got this little tiny piece. One of you this morning, I gave you a piece that was really little. It's probably the littlest one out of the whole bunch. I don't know who got it, but somebody here has it. And you're holding that piece And maybe, I don't know, your neighbor may have got the biggest piece. (laughs) Never forget, he's the one who gave it to you. Whatever giftings and talents, whatever abilities that you have, remember that he's given them to you. And as you and I stand on the, the brink of walking into a brand new year, I want to ask you, what did you do this past year with what he placed in your hand? You say, well, I this or well, I that. No, I'm just asking you, what did you do with what God placed in your hand this past year? And to continue that question, I would ask you, Are you going to go into the next year doing the same thing? You see, often we're tempted to say, you know, well, what I have is, you know, said I got this little clear one that's not nearly as impressive as the others, and we just kind of put it in our pocket and forget about it. Well, you know, because it's really not that big of a deal. I'm I'm not that big of a deal, and nobody thinks I'm a big deal, and I'll never be what they are. And so we just kind of put our pocket and forget about it. Listen, God has people that he wants to touch that you're the only one that's going to be able to touch them. There's a work that needs to be done and only you can do it. Because listen, you say it's not much. God said, I gave you a gifting on purpose. What are you doing with what God has placed in your hands? Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I ask you this morning, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts. Father, I ask this morning that you would speak to us, God, in regard to what you have for us, what you've placed in our hands. Lord, it is so often that we look at things and we we discredit them. God, You've not called us to greatness. You've called us to faithfulness. You didn't call us to success. 
called us to faithfulness. Father, I pray for each person in this room today because there's not a person alive today, God, that you have not placed something in their life that can be used for your purpose. So, Father, I ask you today, pray you'll speak to each person in this room. I pray, God, you'll talk to us about what we did in the last year or maybe even the last decade. God, with what you've placed in our hands. Father, I ask you today, as you look at our life, God, speak to us about what we're doing for you. God, maybe we feel like what's placed in our hands is too old to be used, too new to be used, too immature to be used, too outdated to be used. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, you'll speak to our hearts, God, about the fact that you want to use what you've placed in us for the glory of your name. Speak to our hearts now, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask you to do something a little different this morning. I'm going to ask that you'll come, bring, bring that peace with you. Would you come and stand across the front today? Everyone just bring your peace and come and fill in the front just as close as you can because I want as many to come in as they can. Bring that piece, that glass stone with you as you come. Just keep coming. We're in no hurry. as you've come today often we're not quite sure what God's placed in our hands often we just look at other people and we see what God's put in their hands but we look at our life and we're like well since I can't do that and I can't do this thing then I don't know what God has placed in my hands I want to encourage you this morning to ask God What is it you have for me? Listen, maybe what he's placed in your hands is sending a kind word in a card or an email or a text to people and encouraging them. You know what? There are some people, I'm telling you, they have the gift of encouragement. They're the kind of people you get around them and you feel better when they leave because they showed up. There's some of you, you do have the gift to teach You have the gift to minister. Some of you have the gift of singing. Some of you have the gifting of praying for other people. Some of you have the gifting of benevolence and blessing other people. Whatever your gift is, this morning, if you'll just hold your hand out with that in your hand. The Bible says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 17 said that Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish he held them up and he gave thanks for them I'd like for you this morning as you have your hand out that in your hand understanding this represents what God's placed in your life right where you're at I'm going to lead us in prayer but what I'd like for you to do I'd like for you to take a moment and give thanks for what he's put in you Give thanks for what he's put in your hand. Give thanks for the gifting you do have. Give thanks for the way he can use you. Could you do that right now, Heavenly Father? I just thank you today. I thank you today. I thank you today. Thank you, God, for your giftings. 
Thank you, God, for the things that you've given to the body of Christ, Lord, to bless other people. Thank you for the encouragers. Thank you, God, for those today, God, that can bless one another financially. Thank you today, God, for those who can bless one another with a kind word. Thank you for those who have the ability and the gifting of intercession and praying for other people. Thank you for those, God, you've given the gifting of teaching and exhorting and instructing. Thank you, Lord, today for the gifts that you've given. Thank you, God, for the people, God, that have the desire to send a kind word in a card or a note. God, whatever you've placed in our hands today, we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We declare, God, we're content with what you've placed in our hands. God, we will not look at what you've placed in our hands anymore with disdain. We'll not look at what you've placed in our hands with not enough. We'll not look at what you've placed in our hands with not as good. But Lord, we'll rejoice over what you place in our hands. We'll celebrate the giftings you've given to us. We'll celebrate, God, what you've given for us to do for you. We'll celebrate it because it's you that's given it to us. Father, I pray for each person today. Lord, as we embark on a new year, I pray in the name of Jesus. God, that you'll use those giftings through us. And God will employ those giftings. We'll put them to work for you. So God, if we're an encourager, we're going to encourage more people in 2016 than we've ever done before. And if we're uh, the gift of praying for others, we're going to pray for people more than we've ever done before. If we're a giver, we're going to give more than we've ever given before. If we're a teacher, we're going to teach more than we've ever done before. We're not going to let those things sit dormant in our pocket. But God, we're going to use them for the glory of your name. Father, let our lives be for the glory, for the honor of your kingdom. Both now and forevermore, I pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you keep that glass stone and throughout the year listen don't go home and put a jewelry box in where you won't see it for six years keep it out and when you see it let it be a reminder of your life to take what God's put in your life and use it for your glory now may the Lord our God may he bless you and may he keep you may he cause his face to shine upon you And may you know the kindness and the love of our God through this season of joy. May your hearts be filled with unspeakable joy. Joy that the world cannot give you and joy that the world cannot take from you. May you be blessed coming in and may you be blessed when you go out. Whatever you put your hand to, May God cause it to be blessed for his kingdom and his purpose. I love each of you. Have a great day today. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. We'll see you back here next Sunday morning in the presence of God once again. God bless you. Have a great day today in Jesus.